Hi everyone, I'm Chevelli. I'm a board certified anesthesiologist assistant and I cover videos about anesthesia. And this week I want to cover pain relieving medicine that is not opioids. So if you're interested in that, keep on watching. Part of my job as an anesthesia provider is to get a patient through a procedure safely and comfortably with the priority being safe. But of course, I try to make patients as comfortable as I can through a procedure. And one of the ways that as anesthesia providers, we can get patients more comfortable is by administering opioids. However, although opioids can get patients very comfortable, opioids also have risks or adverse side effects. And some of those include nausea. And as anesthesia providers, we do try to prevent nausea as much as we can. So that's one reason to consider not giving opioids. Another thing is some patients may list opioids as an allergy. And usually patients do that when they have itchiness when they get opioids and they may want to stay away from opioids altogether during their procedure. So that's something to consider as well. Something else to consider is that some patients have an opioid tolerance and you may need to give more opioids. When you do give a lot of opioids to patients, it affects their respiratory drive and can cause respiratory depression. So when it comes to the end of a procedure and to get the patient back breathing spontaneously on their own before you can take out the airway device, some patients may have difficulty with that. So you may have to give a reversal agent called Narcan, which will then act as an antagonist for the opioid effects and will help them with their respiratory drive, but then they may have issues with their pain because you have not reversed the opioid. So you may be juggling respiratory depression versus pain. So this brings me to the drug that I'm covering this week, which is Tordal. And Tordal is not an opioid and I'll get more into that later. And another thing to note is that in terms of fentanyl versus Tordal, I was in a case where this surgeon requested Tordal for a patient that was getting a renal procedure, which was cystoscopy and I believe it was a stent placement. And so I wanted to look more into tortal versus fentanyl in these kind of procedures. And in the study that I read, it actually said that patients that receive fentanyl required more of a rescue medication postoperatively compared to patients that received tortal. By giving fentanyl in the recovery time period, they needed another pain medicine versus by giving tortal, these patients had less of a need for pain medicine in the recovery period. So to me, that was a reason to look into tortal and understand it as an anesthesia provider. And that's also why I want to cover some of the reasons for tortal and some of the reasons against it. Tortal falls into the class of NSAIDs. So NSAIDs act on COX enzymes non-selectively. So there's COX-1 and COX-2. And COX enzymes are responsible for prostaglandin production. And prostaglandins have a diverse set of functions in the body. Prostaglandins act on the central nervous system, they act on our GI system, on our stomach lining, they act on vasodilation on our kidneys, on our heart, our arteries, the permeability of our uh, vasculature. Prostaglandins have diverse functions and they're also involved in the pain process. By NSAIDs acting on COX inhibition, which then inhibits prostaglandin synthesis, that inhibits the prostaglandin role in pain. So prostaglandins cause inflammation, prostaglandins cause fevers, and they also are responsible for some communication between peripheral sensory neurons and the central nervous system, such as the spine and the brain. So by inhibiting prostaglandin synthesis, you are essentially inhibiting this communication for pain and the sensitization of pain between the sensory neurons and the central nervous system. So that's one reason why Torta will work as a pain medicine. There are some studies that show that COX-1 inhibition has more adverse side effects compared to COX-2 inhibition overall. Because of that, some people believe synthesizing drugs that are only COX-2 inhibitors and not COX-1 inhibitors, you can get the same effects for pain relief without some of the adverse side effects. However, there are studies that break down that COX-1 enzymes and the prostaglandins synthesized from that enzyme is involved in the acute pain process. So it's involved in the acute phase of pain and COX-2 is involved in the more long-term duration of pain. So the hours after the initial pain, COX-2 is involved in. COX-1 enzyme prostaglandins are involved in the initial period and then COX-2 enzymes prostaglandins are involved in the later phases of pain. So the, the hours after you're in pain. Toradol compared to other NSAIDs such as aspirin and acetaminophen was equal or superior in terms of analgesia. Acetaminophen is a selective COX-2 inhibitor. There was a study that was conducted that compared IV toradol versus IV acetaminophen. And in the study, patients that received toradol had lower pain scores and also had lower incidences of nausea. Now, in terms of onset of different pain medicines, in the literature, toradol takes about 30 minutes to come on board and provide pain relief. And then toradol is redosed at about six hour intervals versus fentanyl, which takes about a minute to come on board and provide pain relief and will provide pain relief for about an hour. Morphine will take a couple of minutes as well to provide pain relief and then we'll provide pain relief for two to four hours. In terms of potency, I've asked students, how potent do you think Toradol is in regards to opioids? And 
someone had said, I believe that opioids are more potent and will provide more pain relief. But actually, there are studies that show that Toradol will provide at least equal pain relief. There's a study that shows that Toradol for five days, I believe it was intramuscularly, 30 milligrams, provided more pain relief than six milligrams of morphine and at least equivalent pain relief to 12 milligrams of morphine over a period of five days. And so that's pretty big. Toradol does not have these respiratory depressant effects. It's not known to be addicting where opioids are and it doesn't have this euphoric state. But that's a big thing to consider because opioids have their own side effects that people are trying to avoid and Toradol will provide at least very similar pain relief to opioids. Toradol may be sounding like the miracle drug. Why not give every patient Toradol? Why not give patients Toradol from the beginning of the procedure? I've, I haven't really seen that done commonly. One of the reasons for that is that Toradol is associated with prolonged bleeding time. Toradol will inhibit platelet aggregation. And if you're going into procedure and you're doing a surgery, there are some risks of bleeding. So more commonly, I've seen Toradol given towards emergence when patients are waking up rather than in the beginning of a procedure before the procedure starts and you know you have unknown bleeding in the procedure so i always check with the surgeons and i say are you comfortable giving toradol some surgeons love it and they want that given to every patient and some surgeons want to stay away from it for their own reasons so it's always a closed loop communication on administration of toradol however i have talked to my anesthesiologists and my anesthesiologists have 20 to 30 years of experience and they have said that clinically they've never really seen an effect of prolonged bleeding time of Toradol, so that's something to consider as well. A major, major reason to not give Toradol is Samter's triad, which is asthma, aspirin sensitivity, and nasal polyps. And the reason for that is that Toradol can cause airway irritation and it can cause life-threatening bronchospasms. Whenever I see a patient that lists asthma as one of their medical conditions, I always try to investigate it as much as possible. I ask them, do you take any corticosteroids? Do you have an inhaler that you use at home? Do you take albuterol every day? What triggers your asthma? Some people, people say their pets will trigger their asthma or changes in weather trigger their asthma. People will say seasonal, cold weather, that kind of thing. And then I will also ask, can you take aspirins? Have you taken Toradol? Some patients will say, yes, I take that every day. They'll say like, yes, I've always taken that. I've also had patients say that, no, I have never taken that in my life. I take multiple bronchodilators daily. And so that's something to differentiate between. And as a provider, it's perfectly understandable if a patient has asthma listed on their chart to just stay away from giving Toradol because of the possibility of life-threatening bronchospasms. There's also a couple of other contraindications that the manufacturer lists, such as end-stage renal disease, because again, Toradol will have an effect on prostaglandin synthesis, and that has an effect on vasodilation in the kidney. So there are some adverse effects of Toradol and reasons not to give it. Do have a balancing act to consider in terms of Toradol and reasons for and reasons against it. And I would not say that it can ultimately just replace opioids, but it could be a good adjunct for patients that have indications for Toradol. So I've seen fentanyl, which has a quick onset and it will last about one hour, be given more still during intubation or airway manipulation and the initial incisions. Then it'll wear off, but then patients that are okay receiving Toradol, I've given that towards emergence, towards the end of the procedure so that they have some long lasting pain relief during the recovery time. So that's kind of the way I've seen it done and the way I've done it. But again, if people have contraindications for Toradol, I would not feel comfortable giving that. And that brings me to the final part that I wanna cover in terms of Toradol. Now that I've covered the duration of action, the potency of Toradol and the adverse effects, I wanna cover kind of the recommended dose that I've read in the literature. I had a student that I was talking about Toradol and they had said that clinically they usually see 30 milligrams of Toradol given, but they had learned that 15 milligrams may be sufficient to provide that pain relief. And so that made me want to look into how much Toradol does literature recommend for pain relief. And so I learned that with Toradol and NSAIDs, there's a ceiling effect. So this means that you can give one dose, a small dose, and that will give you a certain amount of pain relief. Now, if you were to double that dose, that does not give you double the pain relief. It gives you about the same pain relief that you would have at the smaller dose. You put patients at risk of adverse side effects by increasing the dose rather than giving a lower dose that would provide pain relief without as many side effects. And so from what I read for Toradol, they did a study in which there were three groups that received Toradol and it was 10 milligrams, 15 milligrams, and 30 milligrams. And across all three groups, the difference in pain relief was very similar, not statistically different. The adverse effects were very similar, but the study does say that when you give more, you give a higher chance of harm rather than analgesic benefit by increasing the dose. And 10 milligrams essentially would be enough to get the pain relief that you want without causing the adverse effects versus giving more Toradol 
and putting um, the patient or your risk of more uh, adverse effects. So that's something to consider as well. So again, I do think there's a, a place for opioids, but you also have to consider some of the adverse effects of opioids. And I don't know if as anesthesia providers or in the surgical setting, all patients can be opioid free, but I do think that there are other drugs that can be given to kind of complement some of the pain relief and provide pain relief in a different way. And I've seen that be more so the movement to have some opioid use, but also to work with these other drugs and you know be comfortable with other drugs that can provide pain relief. So if you wanna see more educational videos on other pain relieving medicines that aren't opioids or induction agents, or just educational videos in general, please comment down below what you want to see more of. Um, I definitely plan on doing more lifestyle videos, but I think it'll be fun to occasionally have somewhat of an educational video. And I had a lot of fun learning about this topic, and as an anesthesia provider, I feel more comfortable understanding when to give Toradol and when not to give it. So, you know, if anyone wants to see more educational videos, I'm super excited to do more learning and teaching on that kind of subject. So, again, leave comments down below, and I'll catch you all next week. I hope you have a wonderful week. See you.